Félix Moumier est président. A political assassination attempt, Geneva. Félix Moumier, the leader of the opposition in Cameroon, has been taken to hospital after being poisoned with thallium. Victime d'un empoisonnement au thallium. Félix Moumier is president of the clandestine Cameroonian party, the UPC. The wife of the Cameroon leader, Martha Ekemayong, is expected to arrive in Geneva today. She is on her way from Conakry in Guinea, where she's been living in exile. Forty-five years after the tragic event, Martha Ekemayo has returned to Geneva. She wishes to see again the city where her husband, Felix Mumier, was assassinated. Much troubled, she remembers that on the 3rd of November, 1960, she'd anticipated the worst as she approached the hospital in Geneva. She was fearful because many of Mumier's aides had already been assassinated. The hospital in Geneva. Much has changed, but Martha tries to find the ward and the room where her husband died more than 45 years ago. This reminds me of the waiting room I was in at the time. I remember sitting there. This brings back bad memories. Because when I came in, and they presented me with my husband. He was just a corpse, just a cadaver. She waits for Dr. Daniel Pometa, one of the four doctors who tried to save the life of Mumier. I remember you called twice. When I put the phone down, I said to myself, Mrs. Mumier believes that we are hiding something from her. When I arrived, he was there with closed eyes, his arms crossed. I couldn't talk to him anymore. Mumier, Mumier, he was dead and he would never come back. When he arrived, he told me that he had been poisoned with thallium. He had a glass of Pernod, but it tasted strange. I'm sure that the poison was in this glass of Pernod. At that time, we were very wary about thallium. When someone took thallium, it was almost impossible to save them. The 3rd of November, 1960, 10 past 7 in the evening. Félix Mumier is dead. The world's press carries the news of the death of the leader of the Cameroonian opposition. His closest followers, the party vice presidents Ernest Wandier and Joseph Kingwe, arrive in Geneva. We knew that an important personality had left us. It was a huge setback for the Cameroon resistance. He was only interested in one thing, the struggle for power. He even refused democratic elections. We turn back the clock. This is the small town of Lollendorf in South Cameroon, founded when the country was still a German colony. This is where Martha and Felix Mumier met in 1947. Martha was 16 and was studying to become a nursing aide. Felix was 21. He was the doctor in charge of Lollendorf's hospital. It was his first post and he stayed there for five years. I hadn't been looking for a doctor. I love music, and I said to myself, I want to marry two musicians. But this doctor came along, and we were married. The marriage wasn't accepted at the time, and Marta's father was against it. My father was hostile to it. And because of tribal rivalries, my cousin said, Mumie is a Bamun, and Bamuns are killers, and they eat people. They wanted me to get away from Mumie. But Martha refused to leave Mumie. She became his companion in political struggle because Mumie was a vehement anti-colonialist. He demanded Cameroon's independence. 
Marta accompanied him even when the French tried to sideline him. From 1954, Mumier was posted to distant provinces, Beta Oya, Mora and Marua. He never stayed in the same place for longer than six months. December 1954, Mumia's still in a kind of internal exile, but this time he's posted not to some forgotten corner, but to the port of Douala, the economic capital of Cameroon. Douala was a very well-off and socially comfortable city. Every citizen wanted to live in Douala. Unfortunately, today Douala has become an ugly and shabby town. Marta and Felix set up home here, in the popular district called New Bell, a stronghold of his party, the UPC. Mumier begins work at the local hospital. He was working here at the Lacintini Hospital. He specialized in surgery. He was a doctor in surgery. On the first floor there, the last door, that was his office. In the morning, he worked at the hospital. He came home for lunch, and after that, he went to the quartier and talked UPC politics. He divided his time between work and politics. For him, Douala was the ideal place to work, but this happy situation wouldn't last for long. Then came the times of political oppression. Roland Pré came and declared his programme. In six months, UPC will have disappeared. France had sent out a new High Commissioner, Roland Pré. The European colonists applauded the choice because Roland Pré threw his full weight into the mission he'd been given to liquidate the UPC opposition movement. Martha visits the Douala headquarters of the UPC, or what remains of it, a vestige from times past. At the time, the UPC was a very powerful party. Under Mumier's presidency, it was going from strength to strength and had already become the most popular party in Cameroon. Roland Pré called a conference and attacked the UPC. Mumier convened an even bigger counter-conference. People came from all over to be present. The army came and opened fire on us. That was the beginning of the insurrection. A political meeting on the 25th of May, 1955, ended in a bloodbath. In the New Bell district alone, there were more than 1,000 deaths. At this moment, a manhunt was begun, first at Douala, then throughout Cameroon. Roland Pre imprisoned the supporters of the UPC and the followers of Mumia wherever they could be found. In July 1955, the party was banned. Its founder, Um Niobe, went into hiding, and its president, Felix Mumier, fled abroad. The River Mungo, one hour to the west of Douala. This is where Mumier managed to slip out of the country. On the other bank lay English-speaking Cameroon, still a British colony. From there, he passed through many stages of exile in Egypt and Ghana. Eventually, the head of the state of Guinea, the socialist Seko Touré, invited him to stay in Konkari. Mumier continued the struggle against French colonial power in Cameroon, and at the United Nations, New York, the majority supported his demand for the independence of Cameroon. But at the same time, a new high commissioner, Pierre Mesmer, had been appointed to Cameroon. It was a dark day for Mumier. Pierre Mesmer carried out a masterstroke and turned Mumier's great victory into a cruel defeat. Paris. Today, Pierre Mesmer is permanent secretary of the French Institute, part of the French Academy. This former Minister of Defence and former Prime Minister well recalls his mission to Cameroon. Immediately, I declared that France supports Cameroon's independence and also agrees with the reunification of the French and British parts. Nobody had said that before, fearing Britain's reaction. I was the first to actually say it. From that moment on, UPC was in a difficult position, since my proposal contained everything they were fighting for. So, the United Nations ended up praising the mission of Mesmer, and France received a UN mandate to prepare Cameroon for independence. 
From that moment on, the UPC was now forced to choose, to enter the system because there would clearly be elections, or else to decide to remain in rebellion, and that is in fact what they did. It proves that their real goal had not been independence, but revolution. So the decision was made, the independence and the reunification of the two colonies. On the 1st of January 1960, Cameroon was officially declared independent, and Amadou Ahijo became its first president. Félix Moumier believed this man was simply a puppet for France and called for the president's overthrow. Secret documents prove it. France was afraid of losing her African colonies. In terms of France's colonial power, Cameroon was of essential strategic importance. The position of France in all of Central Africa depends on the position of France in Cameroon. At that time, several pro-communist regimes had come to power in Africa. The Algerians were at war with France. Egypt's President Gamal Abdel Nasser was preaching radical anti-colonialism. He nationalized the Suez Canal and threw out the British. Communism was gaining ground, and not only in Africa. In 1959, Fidel Castro made a triumphant entry into Havana. He announced the exportation of the Cuban Revolution to South America, and especially to Africa. In October 1960, at the United Nations, the leader of world communism, Nikita Khrushchev, openly threatened to provide arms for independence movements. The 27th of October, 1960, the Justice Department in Geneva opens an inquiry into the assassination of Félix Moumier. Who assassinated Moumier? Who was behind it? The replies to these questions should have been found in a dossier at the Federal Archives. However, the dossier was supposedly lost. Lillian F. was a Geneva call girl. For two weeks, she was the companion of Moumier, so the first lines of inquiry lead towards her. Lillian is no longer living, so we encountered her best friend, Jeanette Bosch. He bought many things for Lillian from the most expensive shops. She didn't want to take advantage of him, but it was he that wanted her to have whatever she wanted. The summer of 1960, Mumia is granted a visa for Switzerland. At the Parakeet Bar, he meets a pretty brunette. She's called Lillian. The 2nd of October, 1960. Felix Mumier returns to Geneva once again. His mission is secret, and only his closest confidence knows he is there. He stays with Liliane in a furnished house at 44 Rue des Paquis. Mumier is being hunted in Cameroon, and in France is seen as a dangerous terrorist. It wasn't a secret, and Liliane must have known it. The following day, Mumier hires a chauffeur-driven car. Over a period of 10 days, he's driven to one meeting after another, always accompanied by Liliane. He meets Chinese and East German diplomats in Bern. He goes to Zurich to buy equipment for his guerrillas in Cameroon, then acquires several hunting rifles, pistols and ammunition. It's costing a fortune. In 10 days, he spends 80,000 Swiss francs. The 14th of October, 1960. Mumia goes back to Geneva yet again to meet his chief aides in the UPC. He was coming through Geneva and asked me to come to see him. His journey was motivated mainly by diplomatic reasons. The issue was to inform about the status of the political combat in Cameroon. No doubt there were other reasons too, but I was not aware of these. John Martin Chapchet, who still lives in Geneva, was at the time the president of the French section of the UPC, the only legally recognized section at the time. He hoped to be given a ministerial post had the UPC succeeded. The UPC was planning to form a government in exile. A certain number of students were to be part of it. After the meeting, John Martin Chapchet goes to the Rex Hotel. 15th of October, 1960. 
Shortly after eight in the evening, Jean Martin Chapchet leaves his hotel in the company of Felix Mumier. They have a meeting with a journalist, William Bechtel, who's invited them to dinner. Mumier already knows Bechtel. They'd met a year earlier at Accra in Ghana. It was extremely important for the UPC to establish relations with the press because this was the only way to win public support for the struggle which was taking place in Cameroon. Ten minutes later, Mumier and Chapchet arrive in the old town. Journalist William Bechtel had reserved a table at the Silver Plate, one of the best restaurants at the time, though it no longer exists. It was table number five. Here, Felix Mumier served a poisoned drink. I don't remember if there were guests at the tables around us. Mr. Bechtel was placed against the wall. And behind President Mumier and myself, there was a place where the waiters could pass by and bring the food. I don't remember anybody else in the room. Before the main course, Mumier drinks a glass of Perno. According to police reports, it contained a gram of thallium. Normally used as rat poison, thallium has no smell and little taste. Bechtel showed us some pictures. I don't remember exactly when. He had taken those photos a year earlier, when he had met President Mumier in Accra, Ghana, for the first time. We were concentrating on the photos and not paying attention. And of course, there was no reason to be mistrusting. Bechtel was beyond suspicion. Shortly after one o'clock, William Bechtel takes his leave. Felix Mumier accompanies Chapchet to his hotel and then goes back to 44 Rue de Paqui, where Liliane is waiting. At 5.30 in the morning, Mumier awakens with violent stomach pains. His legs are paralyzed. The next morning, I received a call at the hotel from Liliane. She said I should come. Mumier wanted to see me. So I went over there. Mumier hadn't been feeling well since the evening before. He had asked for a doctor and was throwing up. When he came back, he fell ill. Lillian called a doctor, who ordered him into hospital. At that moment, Lillian called me. I took a taxi immediately. 16th of October, 1960. Lillian immediately takes Mumier to a private clinic. He was no longer able to speak and, and he was rolling his eyes. Because of all the excitement, we were not really taking on board how serious the situation was. I didn't know yet that he had been poisoned. But Mumia's condition gets worse. The doctors are perplexed and decide to transfer him to the regional hospital. He's admitted at 11.30 in the evening. But still, his condition deteriorates, and on the 10th day, he falls into a coma. On that very day, Liliane suddenly leaves Geneva for France. The police believe she's gone on the run. But that's not the version given by Mr. Verges, Le Mumier family lawyer. He told this young lady, my situation is very serious. Take my briefcase and deliver it secretly to the Guinean embassy in Paris. The ambassador will know what to do. The 28th of October, 1960. Liliane arrives in Paris. It isn't until two days later that she hands in Mumier's briefcase containing his secret documents to the Guinean embassy. The police suspect that during this time, she allowed the documents to be photographed by the French Secret Service. At the same time, 300,000 Swiss francs disappeared from the briefcase. So strong presumptions were being made about Liliane in this affair. The 2nd of November, and Liliane leaves Paris to return to Switzerland. Things escalate. At the frontier, Liliane becomes aware that she's being sought by the police. She panics and tries to commit suicide. She has to be hospitalized. 
Shortly afterwards, Mumier's death is announced in Geneva. 18th of November, 1960. Martyr, Mumier's wife, and his friends wait for the body to be turned over to them. He was embalmed according to the custom in Eastern countries. They followed the ritual surrounding Lenin and Stalin. We put him on a special plane sent by President Sekou Touré to collect the body and bring it to Conakry. We all went with him, Martha, his widow, and his two deputies, Oandie and Kiwinge. The arrival had been organized by the authorities of Guinea. Mumier was very famous in Guinea, much appreciated and loved. He was particularly close to President Sekou Touré, who welcomed him like a great political leader. Liliane quickly recovers from her suicide attempt. The police drop their inquiries. Their suspicions about her seem to have been unfounded. Shortly afterwards, Liliane sets up in business and becomes the owner of a clinic for rich, retired people. Ebolawa, in the south of Cameroon, we visit Marta. She lives in a suburb with her brother and his family. Marta is scarred by the life she's endured. After Mumier's death, she was subjected to terrible experiences. In 1969, she was deported to Equatorial Guinea, where she was tortured. Then she was given back into the hands of the Cameroon police. For five years, she was incarcerated in a camp for political prisoners without being either accused or judged. In 1974, when she was freed, Marta was a broken woman, seriously ill, half-blind, and close to madness. Marta is a mother, but political life always took precedence. Right up to her imprisonment, she was a militant in Mumier's party, as he had wished. The day after, we leave Ebolowa. We accompany Marta to a little village at the heart of rough country, an hour by car from the city. Marta wants to show us where her daughter Annie is buried. During the period of repression, she had to move her child's body and hide it. The authorities wouldn't even allow her to put a commemorative plaque on the grave of the child of Mumier. It's me, your mother. You left me when you were very young. Not even 18 months old. Your daddy is also dead. He died for an important cause. He loved his country and defended peace and justice and fought for his brothers. That's why he was murdered. Back now to the house of Marta at Ebolowa. We'd like to talk to her about her years in prison. We know she was beaten and badly treated by the political police. But once more, Marta can't bear to speak about it. So we turn to her brother, who'd also been arrested several times. It was terrible. These are memories I don't want to speak about because they give me palpitations. They're horrible. I know that my sister reacts in the same way. She too suffers from waves of fear. Sometimes when she remembers certain things she went through, she just faints. The 13th of November, 1974. The judicial inquiry into Mumia's murder is still open. Nobody seriously believes it will ever be closed. Then, 14 years after the assassination, William Bechtel, the journalist who'd organized the fateful dinner during which Mumier was poisoned, is suddenly thrown into prison. The murder inquiry recommences. The Mumier affair becomes the Bechtel affair, but the suspected assassin gives nothing away. He remains silent about the murder and refuses even to be represented by a lawyer. The court imposes its own choice of lawyer, Marc Bonnant. What shocked me most was that we actually never talked about the event, the actual crime. I knew I wouldn't get any direct answers from Bechtel other than his claim to innocence. 
parle. He said it like a military man. I have nothing to do with the crimes that I'm supposed to have committed. So we talked about other things, like the glorious wars he'd fought in and his time in the Foreign Legion. I understood that his honor as a soldier and his devotion to the motherland meant a lot to him, rather antiquated ideals in our vulgar times. But that's all we talked about. The federal police already know Bechtel. During their interrogations, they conclude that this man had spent his life as an adventurer. Bechtel William Louis was from Geneva, but had a French passport. He was a chemist that presented himself as a journalist. In fact, he was a career officer in the French army. He had received many decorations, the Legion d'honneur, the Military Cross. He was one of the first in 1940 to follow de Gaulle to London. In 1958, two years before Mumier's death, Bechtel went to live in Geneva, a city which is close to the French frontier. A search of his home turned up some astounding evidence. According to the police report, they found traces of thallium, an important discovery as this was the poison that killed Mumier. The poison will be entirely absorbed between eight and 10 hours after the first symptoms show. The timing corresponds exactly to the moment when William Bechtel was dining at the silver plate with Felix Mumier. The police also confiscated some explosive documents, among them carbon copies, which after technical analysis revealed a detailed operational plan for the dinner meeting with Mumier. Everything in the dossier points to Bechtel as the guilty party, but nothing could be proved and he was freed immediately. The court of Geneva released him on the bail of 100,000 Swiss francs. Did the French government pay the 100,000 francs? He had friends. No, the French state wasn't a part of that. This is Bassa, the province of Maritime Sanaga in Cameroon. The province was a stronghold of the UPC, and for this reason, it is discriminated against even today. The roads are in a terrible state, and many villages are cut off from electricity and drinking water. After staging strikes in May 1955, the UPC organized a guerrilla movement in Maritime Sinaga. The French army responded with a cleaning up operation. It was carried out with extreme ferocity. On May 30th, 1955, the UPC organized a big rally with more than 3,000 people. The French army surrounded the demonstrators and opened fire. There were 79 dead. Without counting the wounded, who disappeared into the bush and died there. Indeed, the gendarmes were not able to effectively stop the rebellion, in particular in the province of Maritime Sanaga, where you'll find immense jungles, huge equatorial forests. This is why I asked the army to intervene. As a result, troops from Chad were sent over to Cameroon. What orders did the army have? To wipe out the rebels. And by the way, the mission was successful. Umniobe and his accomplices were not too numerous. Yet here, in Bassa's land, they were at home, like fish in the water. To keep the population under control, the French army put the local villagers into camps. It wasn't until the mid-1970s that the army abandoned the last of these camps. I mentioned fish in the water. Well, the army pumped out the waters and the fish were left high and dry. 
L'armée s'était forcée. The army was obliged to control certain main roads, and then they had to move the people who lived in villages in the deep forest close to the main roads that the army controlled. In order to make us live here, they burnt our villages. They forced us away in the night on military lorries and brought us here to these camps. The camps were under strict surveillance. At night, French soldiers searched the buildings and counted the villages. Attempts to escape were punished by death, and those who succeeded knew that their families would be in danger. The wives of those who escaped were thrown into prison, their children as well. And the old women and young girls were raped by the soldiers of the French army. You're not overdoing it? Because that's very serious. Is it true? It is true. I've seen it with my own eyes. I'm not telling things that I've only heard of. To visit the province of Maritime Sanaga is to plunge into these horrors, because everyone talks of arbitrary murder, kidnappings and torture. And today the people still live in fear. No one dares to talk to the camera. At Douala, the economic hub of Cameroon, the one-time heartland of the UPC, the police and the army maintain a pitiless control. But Rafael Chulion, a newspaper seller who's been a member of the UPC for 45 years, wants the world to know what happened. He won't speak here, but later at his home. Repression by the police and the military was part of daily life at Douala, from the strikes of 1955 until the end of the 1970s. Supporters of the UPC and the followers of Mumier were systematically tracked down, brutalized and eliminated. Many thousands simply disappeared forever. At nightfall, we accompany Raphael, the newspaper seller, to his home. It was dangerous even to pronounce the name of UPC. The repression was terrible. One kept quiet and in hiding. One special memory haunts Raphael Chulion worse than all the rest. It's the day when the Congo district was burned down and the inhabitants were massacred by the army. It was Sunday, the 24th of April, 1960, to be precise. I was in the football stadium watching a match. All of a sudden, I noticed clouds of smoke over our neighborhood. What happened then? Well, as the neighborhood was set on fire and the army surrounded it, those who tried to escape were shot. You had the choice, either to be shot by the soldiers or to die in the flames. The day after, this district was a scene of desolation. Nobody could put a number to the burnt bodies and the world looked away. At Geneva, the inquiry into the assassination of African leader Félix Mumier grinds again to a halt. Years go by and nothing happens. Five years after his initial arrest, the case of William Bechtel, the supposed assassin, is never brought before the courts. The reason is clear. It would provoke a political scandal. All the documents relating to the case have been kept secret, even until today. But we know that during these years, Bechtel worked for the French Secret Service in Geneva. The police seized masses of photos in Bechtel's house. On first viewing, they seem unimportant. But in fact, they betray the secret activities of Bechtel. Thanks to very refined analysis, they reveal messages written in special ink. According to the police, these are instructions for commando groups to kill or kidnap certain people. Cap Ferret, not far from Bordeaux. Did the presumed assassin of Mumier, William Bechtel, really work for the French Secret Service, as the federal police in Bern say? To get to the heart of this, we visited the home of Colonel Maurice Robert, the former head of the French Secret Service, the SDECE. 
This man lived in the shadowy world of espionage for 26 years, from 1953 to 1979. Bechtel was a reservist with the French Special Services. In those days, the Secret Service often used reservists, reservists of the Secret Service, to be precise. This is how the reserve officer, William Bechtel, operated. Under orders from the Secret Service, he tracked down people to whom he'd been designated. He became familiar with their habits, and he knew who they were in touch with. They all had a common denominator. They supported movements of African independence. And they all became the targets of the Red Hand Group, commando killers employed by the French Secret Service. Among the targets of Bechtel and the Red Hand Group were Ferhat Abbas of the Algerian Liberation Movement, the FLN, and the Swiss journalist Charles-Henri Favreau. In the 1960s, this journalist was a foreign correspondent in Africa. He knew Félix Mumia well, and he had the confidence of the Algerian rebels, the FLN. He survived an attempt on his life by the Red Hand Group because the bomb they'd planted went off earlier than planned. Did the Red Hand group also kill in Switzerland? Yes, they killed in Switzerland as well, of course. I know of three cases. The most famous one was the case of arms dealer Leopold. He was killed with a poisoned arrow because he'd sold arms to the FLN. That's why he had to be liquidated. The documents of the Swiss Federal Police reveal that the assassination of Félix Moumier could have been prevented. In fact, the authorities in Bern had alerted Geneva's police chief, Charles Necht, about William Bechtel's activities a month before Moumier was killed. But Geneva didn't react, because the secret agent and the head of the Geneva police were old friends. So did the Geneva police simply turn a blind eye towards Agent Bechtel's activities, or were the French and Swiss secret services collaborating? The former head of the French secret service, Maurice Robert, replies. Yes, yes, I've cooperated with the Swiss services, at least during a certain period. At the time, Switzerland was like a meeting point for spies. Switzerland's neutrality was useful for special operations and led to many extremes. The cooperation went so far that the chief of the Swiss Secret Service, René Dubois, gave secret tape recordings, taped from the Egyptian embassy, directly to the French Secret Service, the conversations of everybody at the embassy. Did the Geneva Justice Department fear an affair of state? Is that why they didn't bring the assassin of Mumier to trial? One thing is certain. Switzerland, a neutral country, gave backup to the French secret service against Africans who sought their independence. Four hours by road to the north of Douala, we enter the country of Bamileke, a western province of Cameroon. Nowhere else was the oppression of the UPC more bloody and more brutal. Entire villages were razed and thousands of people disappeared. In the chiefdom of Bamenju, we meet Ramo Sukuju. Everybody addresses him as Your Majesty the King. King Ramo was a committed nationalist and a sympathizer of the UPC. He's extremely critical of the old French colonial power and accuses France of war crimes and even genocide. There was indeed a genocide in Cameroon, more particularly in the province of Maritime Sanaga and the West Province. I am not only a witness, but also a survivor, as well as a victim of this genocide. How come you use the word genocide? It is not a question of the death of three, four, or five people. We're talking mass murder. The army took 30, 50 people, shot them, and threw away the bodies. In Cameroon, there was never any genocide. Yes, there were arrests, the lifting of people, but we never embarked on a genocide, the killing of hundreds of thousands of people. 
1956, a young Maurice Delaunay was named as the colonial administrator of Chianji, the main centre of the Western province. He had one principal mission, to destroy the Mamiliki resistance and break the UPC. Today, Maurice Delaunay lives in Cannes on the Côte d'Azur. After having accomplished his mandate as local administrator, he became a French ambassador. He ended his political career as the mayor of Cannes. He clearly remembers the period when he was colonial administrator in Cameroon. This is the hat that I wore as the colonial administrator. They were good times, but when I think back at the job I had to do, there was always the propaganda of the UPC to deal with, and that totally changed the political situation. What did you do to stop the UPC? I installed a big camp in the mountains of Bafoussan where we kept 700 to 800 people incarcerated. How would you describe this camp? A camp with barbed wire. I had been a prisoner of war in Germany for a while, so I knew how to do it. A barbed wire camp with watchtowers around and with French soldiers guarding it. The Cameroon gendarmes were also very loyal in this. For King Rameau and his followers, the name of Delaunay brings back terrible memories. Under his orders, the French army occupied the chief's lands and confined the king to his residence. During those two years of house arrest, my palace was occupied by a squad of French soldiers. During those two years, I was the victim of terrible atrocities. I was tied up. My wives were raped while I was forced to watch. It wasn't the French who did that, maybe the militia, but not the French, no. In 1958, King Rameau was arrested and his palace was burned down. The entire region was bombarded for days. It would begin with two planes in the morning. They flew operations all day. They even bombarded empty houses, just to destroy everything. It was from here, at Bacham, that the French army commandment planned those aerial raids. Just as in maritime Sinaga, they forced the villagers to assemble in camps. The main victims were the civil population as Marie-Louise Mako explains. Is it true that you were starving? The hunger was terrible. We had to leave behind our chickens and pigs. We couldn't cultivate our fields. And when we tried to leave the camps to find food, the UCP attacked us. The inhabitants of these camps were considered as traitors and became the targets of the UPC. The UPC fighters were without military training and were too badly equipped to confront the army, so they contented themselves by attacking the camps. Faced by rebels and sympathizers of the UPC, the army called up local auxiliaries called the Civic Guard. People were terrified of them because they passed themselves off as rebels. They were really headhunters. There were times when we cut off the heads of the rebels and displayed them at major crossroads. Afterwards, the heads were exposed in Bafuzam so that people who passed by would understand, this is what will happen to you if you join the rebels. People were to see what happened if one was becoming part of the rebels. These are fables. I know nothing of this. Just fables. Understand, I dug in with the tools I was given. Mr. Mesmer was my boss. He had given me the responsibility to secure this province. I was only doing my job. Just before the independence of Cameroon, Delaunay would be named the French ambassador to Gabon. The Cameroon army continued the repression led by French officers. 
Between 1955 and 1970, more than 300,000 people were kidnapped and killed in Cameroon. Several tens of thousands are still posted as missing. For Pierre Mesmer, the military operations carried out in Cameroon were entirely justified. The UPC was a communist party led by ruthless leaders. Umniobe and even more so, Félix Mumier were ruthless. If you're up against people like that, you don't go soft and you don't pity them. His point of view is strongly opposed by the international observers like Charles-Henri Favreau, who often visited Cameroon at that time. Military confrontation, yes, but it came only from the French side. The people of Cameroon had hardly any weapons and were poorly organized. Politically speaking, they were militant activists for independence, but militarily speaking, they had not the means to obtain their objectives. This same point of view is held by the lawyer Jacques Verges, who was an observer in Cameroon during the repression. Prisons were killing places. There was torture, there was murder. Everything was totally illegal. There was genocide. Napalm was used against civilians. Napalm, an arm of massive destruction, is never condemned when it's used by the defenders of civilization. All the leaders of the UPC would become victims of assassination, liquidated. September 1958, Ruben Umniobe, founder of the party. November 1960, Félix Roland Mumier, its president. March 1966, Osende Afana. The last leader of the UPC, Ernest de Wandier, was arrested in 1970. On the 15th of January 1971, he was executed on abandoned land near Bafoussam. That was the end of all resistance to French control. 20 years after the assassination of Mumier, the suspected killer, William Bechtel, appears before a court in Geneva. At the end of the trial, everybody is shocked. The judges pronounced that the evidence is insufficient. Bechtel leaves the court a free man. I'd like to point out that this acquittal was even more serious in its implications because it said there's no indication of any crime here. They said it was a case non lu, and that means that the file does not contain the slightest indication of any responsibility. It looks indeed like Mumier was executed. I would say that France couldn't have cared less. But for the new president of independent Cameroon, Ahijo, it turned out to be very convenient. But the former head of the French Secret Service, Maurice Robert, reveals... Bechtel admitted that he poisoned Mumier. Under what circumstances? Well, the circumstances that would fall under military secrets. Marta was never informed by the Geneva authorities of the exact circumstances of her husband's death, but she would make a last attempt to learn the truth. At the hospital where he died, she asked to see his medical dossier, but in vain. The dossier no longer exists. It's been destroyed. She tries to meet the state prosecutor, but he refuses to see her. He blocks access to the Mumier dossier with this shocking explanation. The Mumier dossier should have been kept, but today we can't find it. We accompany Marta to the cemetery. For more than 45 years, the embalmed body of Felix Mumier has remained here. Martha hopes that one day she'll be able to repatriate her husband to his homeland but the Cameroon government refuses to allow it. For the first time since being released from prison, Marta makes her way to her husband's tomb, and she makes a terrible discovery. This is now open, unlike before. The body was like that. There were the coffins of two Frenchmen. 
the coffin of Mumyu was here. But this hole, this wasn't there before. Marta is laid low. The assassin who killed her husband has been declared innocent. The dossier on the crime cannot be found. Even the body of Felix Mumia has disappeared. So what happened to Mumia's coffin? The manager told us that while some work was being done on the cemetery, some unknown people had taken the coffin and dumped its metal interior in another corner of the cemetery. That's the story of Cameroon. The young people of Cameroon must see these things. They know nothing. Everything's been hidden from them. The French even gathered up the bones and burned them.